the monument at Treptow would be dismissed by people who are postmodern as kitschy. It's realistic. It's designed to evoke emotion. It's designed to evoke reverence. Of course, it's important that we honor victims. The monument in Treptow, I mean, it uses the word hero until it's coming out of your ears uh, in the various inscriptions. I think we need heroes. Hello, Susan Neiman. It's such a pleasure to have you on this call and on this Zoom interaction we have. I'm so delighted that we're speaking to each other for this marvelous series that the Goethe Institute, the Thomas Mann House and the Onassis Foundation are putting together around the role of memory. And they're calling this counter memories. What I'd like you to do is first of all, introduce yourself a little bit to our audience and then tell me, most importantly, what happened today in your life? Sure. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll just try to introduce myself very briefly. And um, perhaps with the sentence with which my most recent book, Learning from the Germans, begins, my life began as a white girl in the segregated South, and it will probably end as a Jewish woman in Berlin. And both those pieces are very important to me and, of course, um, important to the subject. Uh, I'm a philosopher. I had standard classic, very good philosophical training uh, at Harvard. My thesis advisor was John Rawls. But I also came expecting to stay for a year on a Fulbright Fellowship to Berlin in 1982. And Berlin, in many ways, took over my life, although I haven't been here continuously since then. What fascinated me the most when I arrived, thinking it's 40 years after the war, there were almost no Jews in the city at the time, uh, almost no Americans unless they were members of the army. And I thought, okay, the war has been over for 40 years and it, it's done and it's gone and I'm not going to uh, you know, blame the Germans as a whole 40 years afterwards, it's over and I can just come and think about Kant and contemporary German philosophy and all of that. So I wanted to show this one memorial, which I have to say, the only memorial I've ever seen in my life that moved me more is Brian Stevenson's lynching memorial in Alabama, which is an extraordinary, quite different piece. This is, I believe, even larger. And it was built by the Soviet occupying forces or occupying powers. It was a, uh, finally built about half a year before the actual state of East Germany was founded. So it's, uh, it's a Soviet memorial. It's also a graveyard for 7,000 of the nearly 80,000 Red Army soldiers who died in the last 10 days of the war in the battle to liberate Berlin, which is a terrible thing to think about. One thing that uh, many, even most Americans and Brits forget or never knew in the first place is that 13 million soldiers of the Red Army died to uh, fight fascism. And people tend to, Brits and Americans tend to think that the war was won in Normandy. And while nobody would want to uh, you know, belittle the sacrifices of the people who fought in Normandy. Um, the West tends to forget what the Red Army did. In fact, it was interesting and important that in the final negotiations over reunification, which are called the, the four plus two negotiations, that is the four occupying powers, the U.S., the then Soviet Union, England and France, <clears throat> plus the two German states, um, which had not signed, there had not been a peace treaty. <laughs> there was a first, right. of, I mean, the war was over, but there wasn't a peace treaty. So there were these negotiations as long as Germany was divided. 
And Gorbachev really only made one condition. Perhaps it was the only one he could get through. And that was that the Soviet war memorials, of which there were a number, and many of them were also graveyards for Red Army soldiers, that they be maintained in perpetuity by the German government. And it was a good thing that he did because uh, I can imagine, given how much people would like to forget it, that, um, you know, they, they would have been gone. And it's, it's, it's truly extraordinary. I, so I went there today. I've been there many times. I've, um, it's something that I've, I've shown friends who were visiting and they're always uh, stunned by it. It's a very impressive space, a very solemn space. So and it's much, much tell us what we tell us the name, what we see, and take us on, if we could take us on a virtual tour of the sure. modern, um, step by step, as if I had had the pleasure of walking next to you and seeing what you see. What I find so so extraordinary, it's it's huge, it's it's several times larger than the much more famous Holocaust memorial that's in the middle of the city. And people don't know about it. It's, uh, you can never get a taxi to take you there. It's not on the app, so they take you to the wrong place. So uh, typically they, I, I went to, I had to go to the wrong entrance today. Uh, it was somewhat more full. It's often completely empty, we're in a lockdown and basically the only thing you can do at the moment is go to a park. So there were a few more people there than normal. Often it's quite empty, except on May 9th. May 9th is the day that uh, the Soviet Union uh, celebrates the end of the war because the treaty was signed by the time the treaty was signed in berlin it was midnight in moscow so there's a big celebration people come from the former soviet union they come from the former east germany there's usually music and speeches and uh children sometimes dressed in red army uniforms but uh uh, today it was it, it was actually it was appropriate for the space because it's winter the trees were bare and they contribute to the solemnity so you you walk in one of the gates there's a big kind of arch which says what it's called the monument to honor the Red Army and you walk in and the first thing you see is an over life size statue of a mother in mourning. And when you realize that, you know, 13 million mothers were in mourning uh, across the Soviet Union, you, you know, you see the power of that statue. You walk then down a lane on each side, there are rows of weeping birch trees that somehow even with the bare branches were even um, more powerful. And then you come to uh, another not quite a closed arch. There are two sort of sides of an arch that represent the Soviet flag. Uh, this says eternal glory to the soldiers of the Soviet army who gave their lives in, uh, in the fight for the liberation of humankind from fascist tyranny. The other side says it in Russian. And then there are two Red Army soldiers kneeling with their helmets off um, in mourning and honoring their fallen comrades. And then you go down a set of stairs and there are graveyards. They're not marked, which is interesting. Uh, it doesn't say that those are graves. Someone has to tell you that they're graves and they were mass graves. And actually one of the practices that is happening in the last few years when people come on May 8th or May 9th is they'll bring a picture of a relative who fell in the battle for Berlin. Of course, they don't know exactly where he or she was buried. There were uh, women soldiers in the Red Army, by the way, and they're honored on these panels. Um, but 
people will bring, and sometimes you have children's drawings uh, along with a photograph and a name and a date of death, and people will put them on the edges of the monument uh, or of the place where the graves are to, you know, the idea being to give back a name to these people who fell, which I completely understand the, the point behind that. Identifying 80,000 bodies in the ruins of Berlin where you had a starving population that you weren't sure you were going to be able to control, where you had an army that had marched back over the ruins of the villages that the Wehrmacht had destroyed. That is, you know, you have soldiers marching back and seeing their homes destroyed, their people murdered, um, a very brutal fight. I'm not sure that identifying all 80,000 people would actually have been possible, possible. frankly. Yeah. Uh, so then you go down, you don't walk on the graves, but there are two rows of things that look like sarcophagi. They're not, but they look like that. And there are nine on each side. One is in Russian and one is in German. And they're bas-reliefs, which tell the story of the war. And the quotes that tell the story of the war are all signed J. Stalin. So they're all quotes of Stalin. And the interesting, one of the things that I find so interesting about this memorial, just so important to think about the ambivalences in history, um, with the exception of the first one, Everything there is true. Everything Stalin said is true. The first one says roughly the Soviet Union was uh, a peaceful place and everything was fine until the Wehrmacht invaded in 1941. And of course, anybody who knows about the Moscow trials and the terror thereafter knows that everything was not fine in the Soviet Union. But um, with the exception of that one statement, everything else is true. And it takes you through the story of, of the war. Because of renovations, the German side was blocked off and I don't read Russian. So I was simply trying to remember what they said, but it's very realistic bar relief of a kind that is meant to speak to uneducated as well as educated people. And it's, you know, it's, it's fairly easy to read. One of the things I was noticing today is how many women uh, were displayed on those bas reliefs. It's some, somehow it's not something that occurred to me particularly before, both women in arms, but also women doing other things for the war effort, um, striking for a war memorial. Well, it makes me, it makes me really think, uh, Susan, you know, why uh, of all the places you could have chosen, you chose that place and maybe uh, by reading back to you the extraordinary line of Stanley Cavell, you can tell us why that monument. I feel the, the epig epigraph to you, one of the three epigraphs to your book, the other one being Amery and Baldwin, the, the Stanley Cavell, which I'd never read, uh, seems so apropos of perhaps a choice of that monument. You, Stanley Cabell says, I don't know where, but he says, history will not go away except through our perfect acknowledgement of it. And I, the, the, what is haunting is the word go away and perfect. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was very happy. I was also a student of Stanley's and I was very happy to find that um, uh, piece. It's in the introduction to Must We Mean What We Say. Um, and and I'm not sure. In fact, I'm rather sure he didn't have in mind what I had in mind. With of course it. not. But, but that, that's an interesting part of, you know, being a quotomaniac by profession. That is what is so interesting is a, a, a quotation of this nature. Um, resonate so strongly with really the, the, the texture of your book. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad. And um, so let me just, let me just 
um, mention, because I haven't, you're not seeing this. So what you don't know from my description is that um, all the while that you're going through this monument, which, which has been very carefully, one almost has to think of it as being choreographed, um, you know, not simply planned. I mean, there was, uh, there, as there usually is, there was a contest and 93 proposals were submitted and all of that, but, but it, more than being drawn, one almost feels that it was danced um, or, you know, planned, to, planned for movement, uh, but over everything that you see from every point is a 30 meter high uh, bronze statue of a Red Army soldier. And he's on a mound, which is a burial mound. And this is based on a, what, as far as anybody knows, is a true story. It's very idealistic, but it seems to be confirmed that a Red Army soldier, as he was fighting and marching through the you know, ruins of Berlin in flames, saw a three-year-old child who had lost her parents and just picked her up and saved her. So you see this soldier on one arm, a little girl, and on the other hand, a sword that has just smashed a swastika. And it's extremely overwhelming. Um, I guess the reason why I picked this monument, I mean, there are a couple of other monuments in Berlin that I, uh, that I like very much. I'm not a big fan of the Holocaust Memorial. Are you, are you not a fan of the Holocaust Memorial because of the way it is being visited now? No, I didn't like it when it opened. Okay. I, I thought it was too. I, I thought it was too abstract. Yeah. And actually, if you want to think about the difference between the you know modern or the pre-modern and the post-modern, you compare these two monuments. Um, I, I find the Holocaust Memorial, and I'm certainly not the only person who complained about it. It's why they put a history museum in the basement of the ground. It's so abstract that it's. Um, could be anything. Could be anything. And it never evoked in me any emotional reaction at all. And I was at the opening ceremony. So it was before people started using it as a Tinder background, which they do. It's kind of a trope on Tinder, uh, my son told me. Um, but the, so the, the monument at Treptow would be dismissed by people who are postmodern as kitschy. It's realistic. It's designed to evoke emotion. It's designed to evoke reverence. So, so there are two reasons why I chose it. One is that I, I just want some truth to be told. I cannot stand the reduction of Nazi ideology just to anti-Semitism. And I say this as a Jew, but I'm a universalist Jew. And I view that anti-Semitism is a form of racism and that racism, I mean, of course it's different. I mean, you know, is anti-Semitism different from racism towards blacks? Yes. Is it different from racism towards Asian people? I mean, the, racism has different forms and different histories, but it is the same, um, comes from the same root. And I'm very insistent that that, that that root be recognized and condemned and that universalism be acknowledged. So that's part of it. Um, I am trying to, um, trying to call out Cold War thinking. I think we're still stuck much more in Cold War paradigms than we realize. But the other thing that's so interesting about that monument, which appeals to me, it's very much a monument about heroism rather than about victims. I'm working on a book. Uh, my next, I think my next, or maybe my next but one book is going to be about heroes and the difference between heroic paradigms and victim paradigms. And while of course, it's important that we honor victims. The monument in 
in Treptow, I mean, it uses the word hero, you know, till it's coming out of your ears uh, in the various inscriptions. I think we need heroes. We, we need realize, heroes. Yeah, we need heroes. I, I, it's interesting I, I, because in preparing to talk with you, I came across this, this line from Chomsky where he said, we shouldn't be looking for heroes. We should be looking for good ideas. You know, whenever I tell people that I think we need heroes, somebody comes back with a counter quote. The favorite one is from Brecht, who said, unlucky the land that needs heroes. You know, I, it's okay. Um, I, I understand. I, I think we need new heroic paradigms. That, yeah. But, but I, I think we need heroes. And interestingly enough, it's something Brian Stevenson told me as well when I interviewed him. And it's one of the things that his monument does so well, because while it, re I mean, it gives you a sense of the horror of lynching, it also lifts up people who led the fights against racism and against terror. And you walk out of that memorial shaken, but with a sense of hope. And he said to me, uh, he said, you know, there are white people in the South who fought against lynching and you don't know their names. And the fact that you don't know your, their names is important. So, you know, while we're talking about monuments and we're talking about what needs to go, I think one of the more important questions is what needs to be put in their places when things go? And those are the discussions that I think communities need to be having because I think if people do not um, have examples of people who lived by the values that we want to honor, it's very hard to believe those values are real. That's the function that that heroes provide us with. And, you know, it's, it, it's a, it's not a, uh, it's not, it's, it's a very untrendy thing to say at the moment, which I suppose is one of the reasons why people tend to call the monument at Trepto kitschy. Uh, it's, it is not a modern sensibility to um, show with a certain amount of pathos, heroic deeds and ask you to honor them but uh, I guess I'm anachronistic. Very interesting what you what you what you say about uh, victims and heroes and someone who is very much in the background for me, um, listening to our conversation as it were now, is Primo Levi, and he said something which has haunted me, Susan, for so long. And I'd, I'd love in the context of, of, uh, of your book and also in the context really of all the thoughts you've brought to monuments for you in some way to unpack this quotation by Primo Levi where he said, I have deliberately assumed the calm and sober language of the witness, not the lamenting tones of the victim or the irate voice of someone who seeks revenge. And I'm wondering how, how that plays out for you. Um, I feel like it's nearly, it's nearly a mot d'ordre. It's a certain way of looking both at the past and of in some way writing about it. So I, I, I always have problems with Primo Levi because, as I'm sure you know, he and Amory were sort of, um, I mean, they were in correspondence. And I always think Amory got the better of Levi, frankly. I thought he was deeper. And, you know, in At the Mind's Limits, I would, I, I found that book much more powerful than Levy's own witness. It certainly, you know, it described things, it taught us things. And um, I, you know, it's very hard to even have the, you know, begin to have the chutzpah to criticize that kind of witnessing. 
Um, but actually, I would argue, first of all, I mean, some anger is pretty, pretty justified. You know, it sounds like he's trying to say, well, he doesn't want to be, come on, come on. <laughs> you were in Auschwitz, for heaven's sake. And, you know, there again, uh, Amari talks about resentment in, in, you know, these incredibly compelling terms and about not being able to get over it. And he has a dialogue with Nietzsche in which he says, you know, in this resentment is completely justified and he's never gonna, going to get rid of it. And he knows it's self-destructive, but um, there it is. And he, you know, so so that's one thing, the lamenting voice of a victim, you know, once again, um, I, I would not ever, 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 I think it would be, you know, more than a chutzpah, it would be outrageous for anyone to suggest that someone who was directly a victim of fascist terror or, you know, in whatever form or who lost a loved one to fascist terror, it would be outrageous to tell them that they shouldn't lament. Of course they, you know, how can they not lament? There's something inhuman about not lamenting. Where I'm more uncomfortable with the notion of, of victim is the way that it's become the kind of coin of recognition that people who were not directly impacted by, um, by terror or violence, that, that is, um, you know, it's a, again, it's a, it's just something that I'm working on right now. So I haven't worked it out entirely. No, no, but, but you can try to talk about how, how the, how the, the idea of victim is used. Yeah. Really, yeah, yeah. Really used as a, as a, as a shield. That's right. A shield is good. And I might use that, Paul. But as it's I say, I'm, I, I, it, I, it's yours. If I do, I'll cite it's you. It's yours. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to work out uh, what I think the right relation between heroes and victims ought to be. But I, I have to say that your, your Levy quote strikes me as strange. It strikes me as um, trying to put himself in a position of neither lament nor anger strikes me as a rather inhuman task. And I'm not sure why he decided, of course, he was a natural scientist. You well, can I was say, about to say, I was about to say, so he was nearly looking at it as if, as if he was looking at it through, a, 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 I mean, nearly like, an, like a scientific experiment. Right. And perhaps the, this is why I'm skeptical that natural science can tell us an awful lot about the human condition. There is, um, there is another line that I want to read to you. I'm not sure the, the piece has yet been published, but perhaps it has. Carlo Ginzburg wrote uh, an article called The Bond of Shame. And I'm I'm curious I'm curious if this this will speak to you also perhaps with your own very relationship to both being in Germany and being an American uh, as you as you quoted in that glorious first paragraph of your of your book well in the first paragraph of the bond of shame Carlo Ginzburg writes the following. A long time ago, I suddenly realized that the country one belongs to is not, as the usual rhetoric goes, the one you love, but the one you are ashamed of. Shame can be stro a stronger bond than love. I repeatedly tested my discovery with friends from different countries. They all reacted the same way, with surprise immediately followed by full agreement 
as if my suggestion was a self-evident truth. I am not claiming that the burden of shame is always the same. In fact, it varies immensely among countries. But the bond of shame, shame as a bond, invariably works for a larger or smaller number of individuals. I just wrote down the reference. I will look it up immediately. The funny thing, Paul, is I just said this yesterday. No. Uh, I, yeah, I've never read the piece. I, we're, we just finished a, a conference on uh, Homeland. And I, uh, and I said, having this lived in, you know, you know what it's like to live in many countries and not feel that you really have one as, as a Heimat. And uh, and then I I finally said I said the country that you feel the most ashamed of. Amazing. Uh, yeah, and and I was you know thinking about the fact that look I'm concerned about the rise of the uh, AfD the German right wing party. Of course I'm concerned about it. I'm pleased and relieved that it's um, smaller than any right wing party of our neighbors. Um, but I'm still concerned, but um, I'm not ashamed, even though I've become a German citizen. I became a German citizen after Donald Trump was elected in 2016. And, uh, you know, so it it gives me a slightly different relationship to the country of feeling more, I need to be more responsible in, in certain ways, but shame is what I felt when I saw that 74 million Americans had voted to, um, you know, give this show a rerun after four years of it. Um, that's the kind of, so yes, I think, I think um, Ginsburg is absolutely right. I, I didn't work it out. I just said it in a couple of sentences. Um, yeah, absolutely. And of course, you know, shame is a complicated thing. Many Germans, one might even say the majority, at least of a certain age, and I'm not sure how far down the age goes, uh, do feel a great deal of shame about being German. Um, That's why they don't like the title of my book. Right, Uh, right. And of course, part of that is what's led to this reaction uh, with the AfD, I mean, in fact, one of their leaders described the Holocaust monument by saying no other nation has ever planted a monument of shame in the heart of its capital. That's true. (laughs) Nobody has. In the book, you're so interesting about um, the importance of these monuments to be there. And and you, you you might elaborate on that. Particularly, I think that I was not at all aware how William James talks about monuments, but it's fascinating. So how important it is for them, for monuments to be there, but also how important it is for them not to be everywhere. Right. You know, I've been thinking about this, and some people say that the debate in the States, you know, we shouldn't focus on monuments, it's, it's too symbolic. And I, I thought about a podcast that I had listened to recently with a voting rights activist trying to, you know, tell discouraged, resigned, poor people uh, who were convinced that their vote didn't matter. Uh, and he said... If your vote didn't matter, they wouldn't try so hard to take it away from you. And I think the same thing is true about monuments. <laughs> I, I was about to say, yes. Yeah, yeah, that, you know, we walk by them, we often don't think about them. That wonderful um, monument uh, that William James gave the dedicatory speech for. I lived in Boston, well, I lived in Cambridge for eight years, but I often went to Boston. I never saw it. You know, I, I read about it years and years later. And then, of course, the last time I was in Boston, made sure to go and see it live. Um, so it is true that you can live for years in a place and not notice the monuments. But the ways in which people care about them, deface them, 
um, you know, defend them, whatever it is, uh, do show how much they mean. And yes, of course, if they were all over the place, they would uh, have, you know, very little meaning, I suppose. But I think one of the most important and successful monuments in Berlin have deliberately been all over the place. And those are the stumbling stones, the Stolpersteine. You've seen them, I suppose. Yes, I, they're tremendous. Yeah. And what's important is that they really are. They're small. Um, they represent, they have the name, the date of birth, and the date of death or deportation of the person who is being honored. And they're hammered into the sidewalk. German sidewalks are are good for that because they're all made of little stones. Um, and the point of them is to say, you know, don't go to a monument out there and don't think that the murder happened way off in Poland somewhere. It The murder may have happened in it Poland. Happened in your midst. Can right where you go to the market. Right. It happened in your midst. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, you know the the line uh, of James, which is so extraordinary, which you which you quote, quote. You say James' speech makes it clear: monuments are not about history; they are values made visible. That's exactly. why we build memorials to some sorts of history and ignore others. They embody the ideals we choose to honor in the hopes of reminding ourselves and our children that those ideals were actually embodied by brave men and women. What is at stake is not the past, but the present and future. When we choose to memorialize a historic monument, we are choosing the values we want to defend and pass on. I find that so excellent. Thank you. I do think it helps untangle the monument debate a bit because when when people in the States go into this, is it hate versus history? Uh, it's neither. It's right. about value, you know? And, uh, you know, that's what we need to focus on. In the context of, of learning from the Germans, at this juncture, looking at what's happening with memorials in the U.S., what, what is the lesson that is still so unlearned in this country? Are you still... Well, first of all, that, I mean, just the fact that it's not about history per se. We don't build monuments to everything. Um, and we certainly won't forget our history if we get rid of some of the most, you know, the monuments to the worst causes. The Germans certainly have not forgotten their history and they don't have, you know, as I put in the book, a Hans Wehrmacht, uh, you know, an equivalent to Johnny Reb standing in every public square throughout the South and in other places. So um, that's a spurious argument. Um, you know, there are other ways to remember history. There are lots of things that can be done with it. I don't think you can make, well, let's see, can I make a, I would say probably that every Johnny Reb needs to go. Um, and there's certainly Confederate generals who I think, uh, you know, I, you know, they were, uh, particularly the worst of them. I mean, some, you know, some who went on to become clan leaders and so on. Uh, but the most interesting question is what we put in their places. Well, right. And, 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 if, and if we don't make them go, um, you know, I'm always reminded of that. I think a wonderful line in David Lowenthal's book, uh, The Past is a Foreign Country, where he talks about the Elgin marbles and perhaps they won't be returned to, to Greece. But if they stay in the British Museum, they need to be surrounded with a context. We need to understand. We need to understand why they are there and why they have been plundered. That's right. Although I think they ought to go back. Frankly, well, I mean, I, I, I think I'm convinced in this debate. I hadn't been sure about you know the European looting of, of colonial treasures. I, I I have become convinced that they just need to be returned as. Uh, you know, one historian who's working on this says, you know, our technology is good. If we really want to have it here, we can make models of them. Um, you know, it's just if the 
original owners want them back, they should bloody well have them. Um, but I do think contextualization is a possibility in lots of cases. It's been a while since I was in Monticello, but when I was there, I thought they did a terrific job of, they were um, renovating, reconstructing cabins of enslaved people. And so you could take two tours, one of Jefferson's glorious uh, mansion, which is really spectacular. And he of course designed it himself. And so you can see life from his perspective, but then you're also asked to see life from the perspective of the enslaved people um, who built all the wealth and at least the tour that I was on did it very well. So two so, narratives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it, you know, which is, again, uh, I reject the current uh, reference to my truth, you know, or your truth. I think, you know, one can usually get pretty close to the truth if you combine different perspectives, you know. And if you simply listen to as many voices as you can, you'll get something like a coherent narrative of a whole. Um, but to go to go back to to because I feel like I might have interrupted a thought, you know, you when we were talking about monuments that perhaps need to go, you pointedly said, but what will go in their place? Right. Right. And I think, so here's my fantasy. I don't know that it will happen, although I gather there's some college communities where this is happening. What I'd love to see is a community by community discussion of monuments. That is, um, because monuments are particular to places as well. And it would, it would do two things. One is, it would actually allow people to learn the history. I grew up in the South. I did not know when those monuments were built. I just assumed, oh yeah, right after the Civil War, people wanted to honor their dead. Uh-uh. <laughs> you know, they were built at two particular times in which white supremacy was on the march in reaction to some gains of, uh, you know, two different phases of the civil rights movement. So um, I, I had to wait until 2015 to learn that. And I'm, you know, there are lots of other things that people can learn about these monuments that they went by without thinking of them much. And then the second thing, though, is that there would be community discussion of what are our values? What values do we want our children and grandchildren to, you know, think about, to walk by when they're, you know, walking to the square or whatever? That would be very much be my, you know, my hope. I think it's happening in some places. And it may happen incrementally in different places and then yeah. might s serve as a, as a way for other communities to deal with, with those monuments and that history. In, in, in closing, Susan. Um, Perhaps one, you know, just about that. I thought there were fascinating things going on in Britain um, with regard to the Colson monument that got thrown into the harbor in Bristol. In Bristol. And, I read yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. That and there really were, I was on a number of panel discussions with British artists and museum directors, and people were really, there were a lot of creative ideas about what to put in its place. Or, what are some of the best ones? Do you remember? Well, I liked Banksy's sketch. Banksy published a sketch just of the people pulling down the monument. He said that should go in its place. Someone else actually cast one of the uh, demonstrators live, an Afro-British woman, and put her on the pedestal instead with her fist up. Uh, someone, I don't know if that's still there. I should check. Um, you know, it's obviously against the law to do all that, but it got done. But what, there what, were, yeah. What there were other artists suggesting that, you know, we shouldn't even replace it with one single thing. Well, I was we, about to say that. 
we should, there are enough artists in the world, give everyone a chance to have a monument for a year or five years or whatever it is and have rotating monuments. You know, so there, there are lots of ideas if communities would come together and think about this without thinking about, you know, a recipe that uh, all monuments have to, you know, follow some you know, some abstract decision from on high. That would be my hope. In in closing, Susan, and I'm sorry to, to quote Chomsky twice to you, but this line seemed to me pungent with meaning and with the comments made in your book about hope, it seems to me an interesting way to end our conversation. Chomsky said, optimism, is a strategy for making a better future. Because unless you believe the future can be better, you are unlikely to step up and take responsibility for making it so. I, first of all, I've got nothing against Chomsky. I respect him very much. In fact, one of the benefits of the Zoom is that we got to invite to the Einstein Forum people who we normally couldn't get to travel long distances. So I interviewed Chomsky in June for the Einstein Forum, and we talked exactly about that idea. Um, really? My only distinct difference with him is, I wouldn't use the word optimism. I think optimism is a statement about the way the world is, is. And that's not something we can know about. I would rather use the word hope, but I agree with him entirely. And as I told him, that's actually a very Kantian argument. Kant makes that argument too. Well, I, I, heard, I heard that resonance too. And I was thinking that in, in some way, dealing, dealing with the past, thinking about what Chomsky just said and thinking about, you know, how can we actually make this generation understand as indeed your, your very choice of, 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 of monument here is make people understand what, what the truth of that moment was. Absolutely. And take responsibility for it. Absolutely. And I, Chomsky is absolutely right. We have two choices. Uh, if we become hopeless, we become resigned and cynical and um, and the world really will go downhill. So there's just not much of a choice. We have, if we remain hopeful, we have a chance that the world won't go downhill. Susan, it's been a pleasure talking to you after, all, after all these years. Thank you so much. I hope someday I can come back to Berlin and visit you again i would love uh love that and um you know as i mentioned with a daughter in los angeles i look for reasons to go to los angeles whenever it's possible to travel again so we i'm will, sure we'll see each other we, we we will alight i'm sure that we'll see each other with with uh, sooner than than we did the last yeah. time somewhere for sure thank you Absolutely. so much Great pleasure. Okay. Bis bald. Bye bye.